Welcome to the Cheap Travel Radio Show with your host, Brian Peters. Today I'm with Susanna Zareski, the author of two books, Travel Happy, Budget Low, and Language is Music. She is a world traveler, she's been all around the world, speaks actually many languages, and she has a great number of budget tips for travel that you can use on your next trip, whether it's a around the world trip or a weekend trip to grandma's. I think Susanna can give us a lot of good ideas on how to keep more money in our pockets. So Susanna, welcome to the program today. Thank you for having me, Brian. Now, uh, in terms of your budget travel, how did you get started? What prompted you to go? And why did you really focus on budgeting as you traveled along? Obviously, you probably didn't have uh, unlimited resources, so I'm assuming that's how you get started in the whole uh, budget travel realm, correct? Yes, yes, it's the uh, lack of resources that made me be creative, and it, it's interesting how I got inspired to travel. So I'm originally from the Soviet Union. I was born there, and my family came here when I was a kid. And back in the Soviet Union, my parents used to travel a lot, even though it was very restricted by the government for people to travel, even to, like, you know, another um, republic in the former Soviet Union. So when we came to the United States, my parents wanted to travel as much as possible. And as soon as we got U.S. passports, we went to Mexico, and we traveled a lot. And my parents really valued the fact that they had a passport that let them go out of the country because they lived for so many years in the Soviet Union where they couldn't do that. So I think the value of travel um, was instilled in me at a very young age from my parents. And the fact that we were an immigrant family, we didn't have money, that meant that I just saw how my parents did all the traveling on little money as, far, as I was a kid. So it was a natural thing to do when I grew up and I wanted to travel on my own. Excellent. So... At some point, you came to the, the uh, United States, and then at what point did you start traveling? Where did you go? And then, you know, how did you get into or how did you find your tips? It was usually through trial and error. Um, you know, I don't think when I started traveling, I had the Lonely Planet books at my disposal. So when I started traveling on my own, I was a foreign exchange student in France when I was 15, and, and I didn't have that much money, and so I just, you know, had to you know, see how I could see the places I wanted to see. And, you know, when I was 15, I was okay with eating bread and cheese. I really didn't. And I'm still okay with eating bread and cheese. So that's, you know, that I was a kid. And so I just did everything, you know, very simply. And um, I think that that started. And then, you know, when I was traveling with my parents, my parents thought we used to always bring an immersion heater, you know, that coil right. that you can use to boil water, make soup, you know, make hot cocoa, whatever it happens to be. And that was actually that's probably like the first thing I learned about budget travel is to bring snacks with you, bring something that you can use to make food, bring a thermos, you know, like a half liter thermos. Because, you know, when you're traveling, if you're buying Starbucks or even if you're going to a little cafe and buying tea and coffee all the time, that adds up a lot. Especially yeah. if you're in Europe, you know, you might be spending two, two and a half dollars on a cup of tea. And if you just had your thermos with you, you know, you'd be fine. So I think those are the little things I learned as, as a child. Uh, and then as I was doing it on my own, you know, I learned when traveling in Europe about the train passes, for example. And this is something that's really important that most people don't know. Mm -hmm. With the train passes, you know, with uh, the Eurail or Europass train passes, the day starts at um, 1,900 hours. So at 7 p.m. today, that counts as tomorrow. So you can take an overnight train tonight, let's say from Paris to Milan. You get to Milan in the morning, you do your thing, let's say you want to go outside to some village, do something. As long as you get on a train by 7 p.m. tomorrow, it still counts as the same day of travel. Ah, very good. So I learned that, I think, at like when council travel existed, you know, back in the day, it was a student travel agency. Somebody explained that to me. But a lot of people didn't know that. So I used that to my advantage. So I planned out my trips when I knew I was going somewhere and I only wanted to see one thing or I wasn't going to be there that long or I wanted to do a day trip and I wanted to take like a local train. I would be able to take the local train on that same day of travel that I had used for the overnight train. Excellent. Now, yeah. now for the folks who don't know, can you explain uh, the Eurorail uh, Pass and how that works if you're traveling within Europe? Sure. So there are different passes. There's like the super expensive one, which is like five or seven hundred dollars for one month of unlimited travel in almost all of Western Europe and part of Eastern Europe. That's if you want to do the I want to see every capital city in a week type of trip. I wouldn't do it um, because I, pr I prefer to spend 
time spending, you know, with more time in each country or different cities than trying to do the American, I want to see everything in two weeks type of thing. So you can buy, tra- you can buy train passes which are less expensive that are country specific, like only for Spain or only for France or only for Germany, or you can combine two countries. And for example, for five days of travel in Germany, I think two years ago I paid 250 or $300 US which was a great deal because just like a one-way ticket from Berlin to Frankfurt is almost already 120 or 150 dollars. Right. So in that round trip, just making that round trip to Berlin and Frankfurt, you already pay for your pass. And with the pass, I know in Germany you can take some of the Rhine uh, boats. So and sometimes you can take buses. You have to read very carefully the directions that come with the passes because you might get discounts for museums or things like that. I think in Switzerland you get into the museums for free with the train pass. I can't remember all the details, but it's important to look at that. Right. And, and yeah. I was, I was going to say that uh, from my understanding of the pass, you have to purchase it before you enter the European countries, correct? Like you have to purchase it in the United States or if you're coming from Australia. But you can't be in the country and get that specific pass, correct? Yes, yes, that's a very good point. And that has happened to people who are studying abroad, let's say in Europe, and they want to get the pass. They have to have their parents buy it or somebody buy it for them in the United States and send it to them. Now, if you're living in Europe for a certain period of time and you have residency, you might be able to qualify for the interrail pass, which is pass that is for European Union citizens or residents. But, yeah, it's the same thing with the Japan travel pass as well. You cannot buy it in Japan. And I learned the hard way by not buying the pass that had I bought it in the United States, I could have used it for some of the internal transport that I took in Tokyo and Mm -hmm. Kyoto. Mm -hmm. And I spent, like, $15 U.S. a day just on subway and train fare in in Tokyo itself. So it would have been worth my while to purchase the pass prior to my trip. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, in terms of... uh other ground transport um, in general, what would you say would be some other ideas um, in terms of saving, whether it's Europe, Asia? Sure. Well, there are also buses. You know, in Europe there's the whole um, bus company, and I'm forgetting the name, but that's, uh, I think, Europe, I can't remember the name of it, but there's a whole bus network. And, like, for example, if you just go to, like, the bus station in Vienna, it's huge. There are a lot of different bus companies. If you want to go to certain parts of Eastern Europe, it's easier to get there by bus than by train. And, for example, if you're traveling in the former Yugoslavia, well, some of the train routes have only been restored recently. Prior to that, you would have to take buses. So there's that. And there are also a lot of budget airfare um, companies, kind of like Southwest or JetBlue in the United States. And in Europe, you have Ryanair, you have EasyJet, and mm-hmm. then there's some regional ones. And you can even just go on Wikipedia and look for um, budget, I think it's like budget airfare or um, budget airlines, and they have a, li- a listing per region. So in Asia, there's Air Asia, and there are a couple of other ones, which are really cheap, and you can buy their tickets online. Um, a lot of those are like no frill ones, so you might not even have a blanket. Or so you know, bring a sweater with you because it usually gets very cold. You also should really pay attention because they have very low baggage limits. So if you have more than like 15 kilos, which you know is like you know 35 pounds or something like that, okay. uh-huh. you have to pay extra. And sometimes it's very expensive what you pay extra. Right, because I think that's where they make up yeah. the, the, the the low fares. Because I know. Ryanair and some of those other airlines will have fares for, uh, f- you know, five euro, yeah. but but the, all the fees are a la carte, so they'll get you on the fees, whether it's baggage or, I know uh, Ryanair was, I, I think they charge now for actually printing out the boarding pass for you if you don't print it out yourself now. Yeah. Um, so that's where they get you in terms of the fees. The the uh, the, the low fares gets you into you know their framework, but then you might have to pay extra for simple things, what I call yes. simple things. 